All right, Matt, JJ, thank you for jumping on the pod. I appreciate having uh, both of you here, even though um, theoretically we're all in, in Texas and in the same area. It's, it's fun to see us in, in, in all separate rooms. So uh, maybe start with Matt, let you guys introduce yourselves, um, and, and then we'll get going. Uh, yeah, Matt Schroll. Um, I am currently the director of business development down here overseeing um, basically our new season ticket sales side of things um, with the Dynamo. Uh, been here since July of last year, so about nine months, 10 months at this point. Um, prior to that, I was uh, I ran the inside sales department at the Philadelphia Union for a couple of years. Um, and then before that, um, was with the Indiana Pacers on the group sales side for a few years there as well. Um, I'm originally from Indiana, so I know you just mentioned that, uh, you know, we're all from Texas, but we're doing this. Um, but it is, it, I think this is still springtime down here, so it's, it's very, very hot for me still. Um, so God knows what summer's going to look like since I came at the tail end of it last year. Um, but yeah, that's, that's kind of the, the path that got me to where I am now and kind of my, my role with what I'm overseeing at the moment with the Dynamo and Dash. It's only going to get warmer. <laughs> <laughs> JJ? Yeah. Thank you for having us. Um, I'm JJ Carlos Castillo here in the U.S. In Mexico, everyone calls me Jaime. Either one is fine. Uh, I started my, my career at DNC, um, had um, three seasons of worth of selling at the Chicago Fire, uh, and then I went back to Mexico to be part of a, a sports consulting firm that served all clubs in, in Liga Max, first and second division toward the end. Um, a wonderful experience. And now uh, I transitioned here as a manager of, of inside sales in October. Uh, so been here for almost seven months. Still have to do a lot of exploring the city, uh, but loving, loving Houston. It's nice to just move to a city and then you get quarantined right, uh, right away. <laughs> it's, always, uh, it's always a good procedure. Um, so. I haven't had two people yet that have been in the same organization on the time. So I'd be certainly be remiss. I know we're going to talk about recruiting a little bit. I'd certainly be remiss if we didn't talk a little bit about what are the dynamo doing and the dash doing right now when it comes to selling during this, this craziness. Yeah. 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 I think one of the big things we've set out from day one was to, which was uh, appropriately like literally two months ago um, when we were, you know, kind of packing up knowing we were going to go home for a little bit in March. Um, I think we all viewed this as being like a two or three week thing. So, you know, we kind of prepared and, and built out some different things to do. And the goal was to remain business as usual for the most part, um, keeping hustle metrics the same, keeping the outbound effort the same, um, knowing that we had a, a real opportunity to capitalize, but at the same time, not viewing the virus as like any type of nothing serious, right? So, um, we've always taught with, you know, objections of like, hey, you kind of acknowledge it, but then you treat it, you know, like as a complaint. So it's basically not something we're going to really acknowledge too much, I guess, beyond saying like, hey, I can appreciate that. <clears throat> so I think the, the big aspect with the virus was more of saying like, acknowledge it and it is something serious. But the way we retuned our script was to talk through more of the excitement of when we were going to come back, right? So when we first left, we thought, hey, April 11th, we're going to business it's just something temporary and then uh, it seemed like every week we were just extending that one out more and more um, so every time we retooled our script to have a different date but the whole goal was to just keep driving the excitement knowing that people were missing sports um, and then on, on our end like we've continued to have you know constant dialogue with reps normal meetings normal training stuff like that to ensure that we're still in a good spot so whenever we do come out of this you know, day one back to normal, it's not the first time we're interacting with, with clients or prospects from that aspect. And we've, you know, been able to maintain those relationships or grow new relationships to help us again, you know, not saying we're going to capitalize on a virus, but capitalize on the time we have now that everybody has a little bit more time on their hands. Yeah, I think that's all. I mean, I love using the idea of business as usual, because I think a lot of teams and organizations and sales reps have guessed or made a lot of assumptions for their fans. Um, that they're not capable of having a conversation right now or not able to have a conversation right now. And I think the organizations that have tackled this best are letting them fans tell them that, right? Like, let your fans tell you that they're not in a position to be able to buy right now. You know, JJ, knowing that you're over an inside sales team with a lot of young reps, um, you know, what conversations are you having with them? You know, a lot of people who may be really, really new, whose first real sales effort is, is going through a, a pandemic. 
Yeah, totally. Um, first of all, um, we, we started in, in November. Uh, we hired we hired 10 and then a few folks joined us in, in January. Uh, and right off from the bat, we, we knew we had a great group. Uh, we had a lot of strong momentum coming and coming in, getting into this pandemic. Uh, but going to Matt's point, uh, just making sure they understand the type of conversation we, we aim to have during this time, because it is a difficult situation. However, the way we we teach our script during this time is to focus and have a have a customer service approach and always holding back in past experience where it's going to open up what kind of uh, situation they had or experience they had with us before and not being in the, the conversation uh, for the future when we get back to normal and can go back to the stadium what would that look like for them right um, so it's we meet every day we train every day uh, we are huge believers in in you know, training and, and pushing forward and, and getting better. So uh, I think that constant, that constant reinforcement has helped the inside sales group grow throughout this process as well. Yeah, that's awesome. And um, I, think it's, I think it's critical that, especially with the, the youngest sales team, but your whole sales team, that you kind of create this consistency. Like, you know, even though we're doing this in our own houses, that there is still a level of consistency to what we're doing every day. Um, and so, you know, when you think about the autonomy versus the structure, like how are you guys as an organization handling, and I think it maybe it's good for each of you to handle for your own departments, like, you know, how much oversight are you doing to what the reps are doing and how much autonomy are you giving them to, to how they tackle a thing? Uh, so we set out basically hustle metrics that weren't super crazy different from what we normally had, but knowing full well that there was going to be adjustments. and. Um, both JJ and I have reps that have children. So I know that they've obviously had a, a different adjustment as somebody who has children. I know JJ doesn't currently, but as someone who has children, um, I definitely understand it. But I think both of him and I have been, we've been understanding of those situations a little bit more, but I think what our main, um, like the, the autonomy versus, versus not, I think the, we, we've had weekly one-on-ones constantly with everybody, which, um, you know, in a normal setting that maybe that was more bi-weekly or weekly for maybe a younger rep, but bi-weekly for a more veteran rep. So we've touched base constantly with each rep and one-on-ones. We've had morning huddles like we would normally have where everybody's together and there's some type of participation. We've currently had, you know, one day for however that many would be about 40 days, basically had somebody present on either an NWL cell team we play or an MLS team we play so that you know, if I'm pitching you a group on the phone or something like that, we talk a lot about painting the picture when it comes to the seat location or the experience. But you know, if you're talking to somebody who's a massive soccer fan, maybe it's a, a cool opportunity to talk about this is going to be Darwin Quintero's first game against his old team, you know, X, X, Y, Z date, whatever that may be. So, and then drop in a little bit of nugget about you know, something cool about Minnesota United or something along those lines. So, We've been doing a lot of that to kind of structure their day, but then that also leaves, you know, six hours between trainings and morning huddles and one-on-ones for them to do their own thing, right? And so while, again, we provided the lead list, we provided different um, directions, scripts, stuff like that. I think the the actual cool thing coming out of this is, you know, as a manager, you always fear of like, man, I can't see everything that's happening. Um, I think that's one thing after, you know, eight and a half weeks or whatever it is at this point, been super proud of is the fact that a we're, we're making tons of calls from what we can track and obviously we can't track everything um b we're putting a lot in the pipeline and c a lot of that stuff's actually coming out of the pipeline in, in the form of being real dollars which is is pretty impressive from that standpoint um so i think it's actually allowed us to think through of like hey when things are ready to go back and brett you know this texas is trying to open up you know a lot sooner than some of the other states um you know, hey, do we need to go back right away or can we play it a little bit more safe because we know our reps are, are, are able to handle that kind of freedom with maturity and stuff like that. So it's actually been very, very cool to, you know, again, as I, I know we were talking a little bit before this, but for JJ and I both not being here for longer than a year um, and a lot of our staff um, either being brand new or again, I, you know, inherited them 10 months ago. Um, I think into this, if you asked any manager, they'd be a little bit fearful of, of what you would see. And I think the cool thing as we come out of this is we know where everybody's mindset is at. And it's again, focused on that one goal of, of growing our fan base through ticket sales. So 
Um, it's given us a lot of opportunity to allow people a little bit more freedom. And then on top of that, prior to, to this early in the day, like we've had a group we've been meeting with to talk about how to grow them into leadership roles. And I think that conversation over the nine weeks, once a week, has been evolving more and more because we know we can handle this, this weird virtual environment right now. So I think that's been pretty cool to see um, the transformation from you know, mid-March to mid-May. And again, hopefully we don't see that through like mid-June or mid-July. Hopefully I'm ending that time period sooner and we're back in the office. But I think that's been one awesome thing we've, we've seen from day one to now is, yeah, we're still structured, but we probably don't need to be as structured as we necessarily thought we were because um, our whole staff is capable of continuing the mission we're on. I also think, and, and going back to, to inside sales, and I have much less experience than someone in match team, but uh, we have a, a really cool mentorship program where uh, you know some of, of the more senior guys are paired up with inside sales, and, and we provide a structure for them to, to guide them and provide valuable feedback. Um, we do personal development sessions every single week, so every Wednesday. Um, so going back to the previous point on, you know, what are some of the things that I think have helped us keep pushing forward is understanding that we have to outwork everyone and we have to be the, the hardest working team in the country uh, for what we want to accomplish. So um, I think having that, that constant mindset every single day, I think has been awesome. And like Matt mentioned, I think it, it makes, I think all of us really proud of, of, of how our, our staff is handling the situation. That's awesome. And you that, that you made that I think is really interesting um, cause I was just, I just experienced it last night was I went to a restaurant for the first time last night. Um, and they had no idea how to handle the amount of like delivery orders that they have to make the DoorDash people coming in and seating at 25% occupancy. Like we were there, there was one other person in there and it took us 45 minutes to get our food. And you could just see them running around the whole time because they didn't understand how to staff it. They didn't understand how to be able to do that. Like, I think it's easy for a rep to think like, well, they'll just open the doors and 25% of us will get back. But it's actually way more nuanced than that because the minute that people, the minute that people had to get out here, their rhythms were changed. And the minute that we get back to the office, their rhythms are going to be changed again. And so I think being, and there's, there doesn't have to be an answer to this, but I think being really thoughtful about the way that we bring people back into the office, um, you know, whether we do it systematically or we do it all at once is, is, I think it's a more, last night proved to me it's a way more difficult conversation than I think a lot of us thought it was initially. Yeah, I think to that point, like, I know that our, our management team and our stadium staff have put a lot of thought into any type of return scenario, whether it's just to the office or obviously for, for games, you know, when we can play with, with, uh, with obvious people in the crowd whenever games are going on, right? Um, and I think one thing that has kind of been thought about from our staff is like, you know, if we're all wearing masks, it makes obvious sense. How do you make phone calls with masks on? Are you being able to be heard from that standpoint? And I think, again, to this point, the, the big thing we've learned through this is, well, if that's the situation, maybe we're just better off continuing the, the world we're currently in until that's capable. That way it's not super hard to hear somebody on the other end of the phone or vice versa um, and allows us to continue to be efficient with what we're working on from that standpoint. And maybe there's smart things, right? Like you could do one or two of the, just so you get face to face, you can do one or two of your meetings in the office every single week, or you can do a sure. training in the office every single week. Um, although I know knowing Houston, that's going to be a challenge for the people who lose half their day sometimes making the commute. But I think, I think we can be thoughtful about it. But I think when it comes to your point, like a lot of sales really is emoting into the telephone and really connecting with people. Um, and so you know, doing these, you know, being in the office and doing a Zoom with a potential client, it's actually really good right now, but you don't have to do it with a mask on, you don't want to be calling with a mask on. Um, so I think being really thoughtful about all those things, it's, it's, it's just like anything else, you know, you start pulling like one thread on this, and it just unravels the whole shirt. And so I think it's, I think it's going to be a real challenge um, as, as we continue to do this. That is not totally why we're here. Um, you know, one of the things that, you know, you guys know, I've always been a proponent of, are getting people into the building, being able to see reps before you hire them, not just a half hour interview by themselves, but in this real sales combine environment where you get to track and see everything. JJ, if you can talk really quickly about what a combine is, um, and, and maybe both of you guys talk a little bit about, you know, why it's so critical to your recruiting process. 
Absolutely. So a combine is, um, you know, it's an event that provides an opportunity for those wishing to pursue a career in, in sports sales, uh, an opportunity to, to learn sales techniques. Uh, and also we provide an inner, inner, interactive training. So I think the, the way we set it up is, is very cool because you get both. You get learning experience and you get to actually use that learning experience through interactive training. Um, obviously, we will be doing it virtually here at the end of the month and it'll be a little bit different, but it is incredibly important to us to, to identify the, the best of the best. So we've, we've been pretty happy with the amount of applications that we've gotten for this virtual training uh, at the end of the month. And we look forward to, to having 50 folks in, in this training. So um, it's, it's gonna be awesome. We, we are going through details on the different Zoom links and how we're gonna do the games, but uh, we're, we're gonna need help from everybody and we're really looking forward to it. So we can get to the nuance of the virtual training in a minute, but Matt, you know, as, as, a, as a senior leader on the ticket sales team, you know, when you get into a combine environment, you know, what are the advantages of the combine environment and what are you looking for out of the reps in that type of environment that you wouldn't necessarily be looking for from a tr more traditional interview process? Yeah, I think from the interview process, we'll start with that one first. It's, it's very easy and the way we set up our interview is not earth shattering or anything, but we don't necessarily interview, especially on the inside sales front, we don't interview anybody that, to see what their sales experience is like. Um, we're big believers that we can teach you the right way to sell. Right. I think what we would interview on is more of like those intangible traits I can't teach you. You know, are you competitive? Um, are you coachable? Do you have the passion for this industry? Or are you just trying to get your you know, foot in the door type of deal? Right. So I think those are that's your traditional interview. And you can learn a lot from somebody from that standpoint, whether it's phone or in person or a Skype one, because you can, you can you can learn a lot about them. I think the cool part of what the combine provides is to JJ's point, you know, we're going to walk you through super accelerated, basically an inside sales onboarding, right? All within a day. And you're going to learn a lot and we're going to throw a lot at you. And I don't think if, you know, Brett, if you were, you know, potentially coming to try and be an inside sales rep with the Houston Dynamo and Dash, I would never expect you in eight hours to have soaked up every single thing and be perfect in a role play. Yeah. But what I do want to see is how do you role play? Or if we're doing a game um, where we're matching people up and seeing how they interact, like, what is your interaction like? Because I, I think a big piece to the whole sales side of it is you also got to be a good communicator and you also got to be able to have that improv ability. And, and all the games and all the trainings, they're, they're setting you up basically on purpose to see how you react to some things that you know, we would look for to have a successful rep. And, and the big piece of the combine to, I may be jumping the gun on a question here, but is to obviously find that next potential group of inside sales reps. Um, that we can bring in with the Houston Dynamo and Dash because I, it's to our point of, you know, we're big believers that we can train you the right way. If we can train you the right way and we can see that awesome interaction you bring, like we can get an idea and a read on you of what kind of valuable addition you'd be to the ticketing culture as well, which all three of those are like massive pieces to making our team move forward and continue to sell out the, the building with that hard work. Um, and on top of that, I think looking at it from like my perspective, right? Like these people would interact with JJ on a like minute by minute basis. I'm looking at it as like, I want my current folks to keep growing their careers, whether they're gonna be leaders or, or premium sellers or sponsorship reps, right? And the inside sales group is hopefully within a year kind of gonna be you know, under my, my wings at that point when JJ's bringing in more people. So um, that's from my perspective, some things I look at because I'm looking at it long-term, whereas I know JJ's gonna look at it short-term and I don't think one's right or one's wrong. It's just we have different lenses on it based on, on kind of what our different roles are. Um, but I think that's the best piece of it. So um, that's a normal environment, right? There's going to be some weird nuances like we talked about earlier in that virtual environment, but um, that's the big piece we look for on, on that front from what we're doing. Yeah. I think what's really, for me, what's always been important about the combines is uh, you touched on the cultural piece. And I think more than just seeing how do they do in a role play, how do they take in information and knowledge, you, maybe you guys can speak to those, like you can actually see the integrity of a person in the way that they interact with their peers, in the way that they interact with senior management. You can see how full of crap they are. You can see them in a lot of ways. Like you can be coached to get through an interview process in a really good way. But, you know, whether it's over, you know, four or five hours in a day or over two days and, you know, eight hours, 
it's it's you can't fake it for that long like the cracks in the armor show the more amount of time that you're around these people and so what are you guys for the culture of the houston dynamo what are you guys looking for specifically from um a personality standpoint and a characteristic standpoint when you guys are looking to make these hires what's critical for you guys i think uh for me it's always been about passion uh i believe that passion allows you to communicate in a, in a better way in, in anything that you sell uh outside of our industry or from within i mean if you're passionate of what what you're selling you're, you're gonna come up in more genuine and going to communicate the excitement and, and all of that to the customer. So I, I think for me, passionate and, you know, discovering the why. So we, we go over, you know, what is the why of the customer? And why would this person buy? Me? So why does this candidate want to be in the sports industry? Like, yeah, you know, yeah. why, why does one work? Why does, why, why does he or she want to be in sports? So for me, that's, that's very, very important. Um, number two is, is incredibly important for me to know what, how consistently has played in his or her life. Uh, and, you know, tell me a story of, you know, how consistent you've been in your past roles and uh, what are some of the goals that you have currently and how are you working towards those goal and what kind of habits you have to accomplish that goal? Because that allows us to understand that this person is gonna be constant in the phones and in meetings and that will come in revenue, right? And in appointments. So uh, I think those two for me are incredibly important aside of, you know, integrity and honesty and and work ethic, but um, those two for me are, are incredibly important. I think that's a great, sorry, a great point because like, that's what it really does is it gives you the chance to see that consistency because I can teach someone how to sell, but I can't teach someone how to make 150 calls a day. You either have the, the grit to do that or you don't, yeah. that's something that exists or it doesn't. And so to watch people, the way they are consistent over a day or two days, four hours, eight hours, you know, whatever it is, to watch them and force them to be that consistent in the way they portray themselves and put themselves out there. You see a lot of people who slip, like a lot of people who are falling off by the end of the first day or the second day. And I think that that's a really unique way to be able to see it because I love that you use consistency as, as an important characteristic, JJ. You don't hear that a lot when you talk to people who are recruiting. But again, at the end of the day, I can teach sales till I'm blue in the face, but I, and a rep can be perfect when they're in practice or on the phones, but if they're not willing to go out and take the ground balls, they're not going to be good in the games. That's, that's an excellent analogy right there. Um, I generally say like, you got to be a shortstop from that standpoint. And while every shortstop wants to make a flashy play like Derek Jeter, um, there's generally that position gets the most ground balls that are the mundane outs um, that you got to kind of work with from that standpoint. But to that piece on the, on the culture aspect, I think, to slightly go off of that. I think one big area that we feel um, very strongly about as well is portraying our culture, uh, if that makes sense. Like I, I've been in places where they just throw out a teamwork online listing and let the applications come through and just pick the litter, pick the best of the litter. Um, for us, I think the way we view this is also like a, a college coach. Like I've always joked that, you know, for inside sales, you want to be the university of Kentucky and, uh, and, and, you know, our VP has different thoughts on what college program we should be. Um, but I'm a big believer, like, I want... You don't want to always, want to always be the offensive lineman. Just tell that's me. what I said. I said, nobody wants to be Iowa, right? Like, that's, you know, that's boring. So I said, you got to be Kentucky. You want the very best studs. You only want them for a year because your hope is they're going to the next level. And I always joked that when I was running inside sales department, I was John Calipari, right? Yeah. And um, whether you like John Calipari or not, I think we can all read between the lines on some of his recruiting tactics of places he's <laughs> up with. And uh, part of that is selling yourself to that candidate. So um, we also have things mixed in with the combine of, of having our, our CRO, Deanna Witter, talk a little bit about some of the cool things we've got going here to start the day. We've got folks that we've hired from previous combines that are going to be on and, and talking a little bit about what they got from the combine and how that helped them achieve where they are now. Um, and then I think our goal is to wrap it up with, with our VP, Jacob, Jacob Hanselman, kind of wrapping it up and, and giving a little, not only a thank you, it's almost going to be like a, it's going to feel like a, uh, like a, like an assembly at high school, right? But it's going to be something of a thank you, but a little bit of a wrap up piece that kind of ties a bow on all the cool stuff we're trying to do here and why everything we did up to that point was super important. So as, as much as it is for us to look at if that person could be a fit for us on the sales front, on the culture front and all that, which is huge piece of this 
I think the small piece that nobody's going to really think too much about is we're also selling our organization as like the place to be when everybody's able to start hiring again and whatnot. And, and I think that's very important to what we're doing as well. I, I think that's a huge piece. And, you know, one of my favorite things, you know, is, and you can feel free to, to tell Deanna this, but, you know, when I was at the Columbus crew is one of our few ways to win people from the Cavs um, was to give them a view underneath the hood of who we were and allow them to make a decision if they wanted to choose us for the Cavs. Because they're just gonna choose the crew and our crappy stadium versus the Cavs and everything they had going on. They're just gonna choose the Cavs, right? Like that's exactly what a young young salesperson is gonna do. But if they get to know us a little bit more, it creates an inherent competitive advantage for us at the end of the day. Now, most kids would choose the Cavs, but we were able to get a couple of them because they connected to what we were doing, um, because they connected to what we were doing in the process. And so I think that, I think understanding that piece and one of my favorite things to say at the sales training forums is listen, go prove me wrong. We're going to choose against a bunch of you here. Like we're not going to make offers to a lot of you here. Go prove me wrong. And man, I still get one note a year and it's now it's usually from the same two or three people. Um, but I get at least one or two notes a year being like, Hey, you cut me from this forum. Now I'm doing this. Now I got this job and I'm doing this well. And man, I love that. I, I tell them those are some of my favorite emails or some of those LinkedIn messages. Those are my favorite ones every single year because recruiting is an inexact science and we are certainly going to cut people that deserved to have a role with us. And we are certainly going to take people that probably we're going to know within three days was a bad decision on our part. Um, but at the end of the day, it's inexact, but giving them this opportunity to get to know us, us to get to know them, I think it tilts the odds in our favor just a little bit more, um, especially with the amount of time you're able to spend with them here. So to that, you're not actually able to spend time in the room with them. So I'm actually really interested because I know a lot of organizations do do these combines. I have to imagine, and you're the first one I've seen that's going to do this virtually. What are some of the nuances that you guys have been thinking through? And, you know, maybe we can start with Matt on a more senior level and go down to JJ on a more tactical level. But like, what are some of the nuances that you guys have had to think through to be able to make sure you can be as close to as replicable as you, as you would be if you were hosting it in person? Yeah. I, I would, the big piece for us is JJ's built out our schedule, right? And the schedule isn't terribly different in terms of topics and order we're going to go through that we did in a normal uh normal combine i think the interesting thing is jj's had to build out like 10 minute breaks here and there because we're going to switch from a zoom room i'm going to call it a room we're going to move from one zoom room to another where we can have 50 people go to 10 here 10 here 10 there 10 here and then have managers follow them and have some of our, our senior reps on board as well to kind of help from that standpoint so i think more of the um, logistics of it are a little bit different to think through because nobody thinks like, oh, moving from one activity to another, like I need to plan out 10 minutes because we're going to have to send a, an, an, a, a new link invite to these 10 people or to these, you know, 12 people, whatever it is. Um, so that's one piece of it. And I think uh, to that point, um, and I'll let JJ kind of pick up on this one, but um, some of the the games we'll play throughout the day that are reinforcing whatever topic we're just learning. Um, those are going to have to be set up much differently. Um, I think in a normal setting, you would just do it face to face. There's like no thought given to it. It's like, oh, you're in a line. Like I'm next in line. I talk. And, uh, you know, I don't know how I'm situated on your guys' Zoom screen, but like I'm over at the top of this like right triangle and Brett, you're on top and, and JJ's on the bottom of the triangle, right? And everybody's zoom screen may look completely different and now you add in 50 people and we're all on different things and there's a second page to it and whatnot. So, um, that piece of it is not super easy. So JJ, I'll, I'll let you kind of talk more on the games from that standpoint, but that's probably the, the big difference. I think not to cut JJ off real quick, but like that was something I, I, I did it. I did my first real virtual sales training the other week with the team uh, probably about two weeks ago. And I remember I've done a couple since, but I remember going into that first one thinking like, this is going to be impossible. Like it is going to be impossible to replicate being in the room and doing it. But I think all of a sudden when you start to understand how you need to make some adjustments, it starts to snap into place. So I'm interested, you know, the, it was just reminding me of that when you said it, like you have to think through these things, but it's like the nerdy side of me likes figuring that stuff out, right? Like it's cool to figure <laughs> out what, 
the mechanics of that are going to be at some point. So, you know, I'll let JJ jump in here. Yeah, um, just like Matt mentioned, when, when we started building it, uh, you think about the transitions uh, from topic to topic. And, uh, you know, after going to a break, you, then that's the time where you split into groups and then I'm just making sure, I mean, just making sure like the whole uh, material flows well uh, along the way, um, that we are plugging in the games right at the, at the exact time. And one of the cool things that we plugged in here also is we will always have like a recap uh, and a full role play after we teach step one, step two, uh, then, you know, break, uh, step three, then we'll go into small groups and then we'll do a game, but then we'll stay in that link and then we'll do a recap. All right. So just to make sure that you guys understand. So step one is this, step number two. So uh, I think that reinforce, uh, you know, you know, kind of statement to, to the attendees is going to be huge because he's going to allow to stick uh, and then they're going to use it. And everything is going to be built up to end of the day, we're doing a full role play and we'll have uh, some of our, our best reps in, in the combine as well. Uh, so they can evaluate and provide feedback and jump in if there's any questions. So um, yeah, just making sure uh, that attendees get the best of the best throughout this experience. They have fun, they're engaged and we can walk away knowing and identifying some, some real rock stars. Please talk real quick. Make an important point, like you have, you have reps involved. And I always thought it was important, especially to have our senior reps involved in this process. I'd love to hear that you guys are doing that. Why are you not just including management team? Why are you involving reps in this process? Why is that important to you guys? The big thing for us is we've, since like day one that at least I got here, and I know that the, the, the ideas were already here. Um, we're big believers, like everybody that's in our positions right now, like JJ, myself, other managers, like, I don't think this is our end game, right? Like, I don't want to be the director of business development for the Houston Dynamo and Dash for the rest of my life, right? I want to become a VP, and then I want to become a CRO, and then a team president, right? Like, I, that's what I want to do. JJ, I know, has, you know, similar aspirations. And for us, like, if it was just management, like if I never had an opportunity as a rep, I never could have gotten exposed to some of that stuff. So for us, like we're big believers in developing people, not just people who are going to be high functioning sellers for us. So we know full well that doing that, like, okay, we're probably going to lose some people to some, some next level management jobs because they're not always going to be open with the dynamo or the dash. But I think that allows us to, you know, continue to grow what we're doing here and then help, obviously our own careers from that standpoint too, if we're also helping grow more leaders. So um, for us, like we view this as like a no brainer to have those reps involved. I think we've got like 10 or so reps, 10, correct JJ? Yeah. Um, 10 people on, involved that are going to be helping us throughout that day. And we view the trade off of like, you know, we've talked business as usual. We're basically saying F it to a day of work for 10 people. Um, but we view that so strongly in terms of developing people that, it just makes endless amounts of sense versus the potential 80 phone calls they're going to make or any sales they're going to make. Cause some of that stuff in theory can, can happen that next Monday. Right. Um, but the experience and exposure they're going to get may not, may not be there on Monday. So if we don't do it on Friday, right. So uh, I think that's a big belief we've, we've had as a team and we're, we're more committed to not only growing the dynamo and dash fan base and selling out games, but that other aspect of, of our culture is continuing to grow people who want to make those, those climbs up the mountain. Yeah, absolutely. I don't know how many uh, forums that you guys have been a part of, um, but what is your favorite sales training forum story? Um, and I'm more than happy to give one of mine <laughs> um, to, to kick it off or end it. You guys can decide if I open or close. I want to hear you open it. Yeah. So um, I, I want to say Jacob was there with us at the crew when we did this. Jacob Hanselman, the vice president of the Houston Dynamo and Dash, um, was my inside sales manager at the crew. And so we had a kid that came, this big, burly football player who came late, sweating all over the place, shirt not tucked in, comes back the next day, like same shirt, same outfit, not tucked in again. I mean, you're very clearly getting used to this environment. And... We, our boss, our vice president at the time was a guy named Clark Beacom. And Clark had this, I don't know if Jacob's told you this, but like if he didn't like someone by anything, he would just rip their resume out of the binder that we were using and throw the resume away. And so basically like he ripped 
this guy's name out like within the first 10 seconds. And so we get to the end of day two and this kid has been incredible. Like has just, like doesn't look the part, but acts the part, the integrity is there, the enthusiasm is there, the energies. So everybody at the end of the, like the second day, right before we're going to make offers, we're just like, so everyone's in for his nickname was big country. So we'll just call him big country. Keep name redacted. So everybody's in on big country. Right. And everybody was like, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And we kick around and Clark's just looking like this. He's like, who's big country? <laughs> Cause he can't see the, <laughs> in the book in the first five minutes, but you know, the funny end of this is the kid went on to break every inside sales record that we had at the Columbus crew. And, and it had been pretty well, pretty well established by that point it ended up being one of the best salespeople that, that I'd been around in my history at the crew. So that was, just, I just, I'll never forget Clark being like, he's been there for two days watching all these people. He's our vice president. Just be like, who's the country. I've got a, I've got a similar one. And when I was in Philadelphia, um, we would go through like doing these interviews and stuff and um uh, i'll never forget we you know we're doing a bunch and and one person's time slot to come and interview was like with our vp and myself was i don't know like 4 30 let's just call it 4 30 right and, and those things would last anywhere from like a half hour to 45 minutes um and it's you know it's 4 29 and the person's not there yet, which whatever, as the receptionist hadn't said anything. So I was like, oh boy, you know, we've already gone through like six at this time at this day in a row. Um, so we're, you know, we're trying to end the day. And uh, I remember our, our VP, you know, just keeps looking at his clock. I'm just sitting in his office hanging out. And uh, it gets to be about five o'clock. And at this point, I've gotten an email from this person. It was like, hey, I'm stuck in traffic. I'm still on my way, yada, yada, yada. And uh, so I'm, I'm relaying that information over to my VP and, and I will never forget the words he said, this, oh, this person, this person better knock this shit out of the park. <laughs> We've already done a few interviews today. You know, I, this person better be phenomenal because I'm going to tell you right now, they're going in two strikes down already, two and a half strikes down. And this person comes in, finally gets there like 45 minutes late. Um, finally, you know, goes through the interview process. I'm walking this person out of the office, come back into my, my boss's office to kind of reconvene and see what his thoughts were. And he just went like with a big sigh, like, she knocked that shit out of the park. <laughs> uh, that person went on to just destroy like a faith and family and an initiative that nobody had really taken over um, to the point where it easily got her promoted and, and whatnot from there. But uh, I would say under normal terms, like, dead in the water, you know, if you were late from that standpoint with, with in Philadelphia, but it was, it was one of the craziest things. Cause we both went in like, there's no way this is going to work. Like we're just want to get the day over. And it ended up being one of our, one of our better inside sales reps there. Big shoes, JJ. I, I mean, I, I'm, I've been, you know, while you guys were talking about your stories, uh, the one that comes to my mind right away was when we we're doing a, a sales training in Mexico. And um, as, as you both know, sometimes in these combines and when you're role playing in front of everybody, that might be even harder than just picking up the phone, right? So uh, we, were doing, uh, we were doing some role playing in front of everybody with the, the chairs like you know, the other way around, right? So we have uh, this guy and then this girl, two different clubs. Um, and then you know, he has the script and he's going, he's like the, one of the very first times that we've done it with with him uh and he starts reading and he like freezes and then i mean everyone's looking there's like 40 people in the room uh and then and i asked like hey like you know are, are you okay like do you need help and this and that and then he's like i'm just really nervous and then i was like all right i mean you need help he's like no no, no give me a second i got it i got it and then he took like another new breath he did it again and he just ran smoothly and I was, there you go, man. You just made yourself better just because you made that decision. So not, not a, maybe not like a funny story, uh, but I thought it was like a very rewarding story uh, in a sales training. Yeah, it's cool. And those are the, those little moments, like, you know, especially in the sales combine, you know, they're probably not going to knock the role playing out of the park, but those people that just freeze and just stop and give up, those aren't people that you want, right? Like you want those people that screw it up, take a deep breath and are like, run that back. I got, I got this now. Like, 
you know, even if they screw it up again, that's the type of personality that you can see in a, in a, in a combine that you wouldn't, you wouldn't necessarily get in just a, in just a, in a, in a regular conversation. Yep. Listen guys, I had a blast. I appreciate both of you. Um, we will um, get this up and I, I know that recruiting is a topic that I'm starting to hear a lot about. You know, a lot of organizations are spending more time thinking about how do we save people or how do we furlough people or how do we let go of people. It's really neat to be speaking to a team in an organization that's thinking about, well, how can we bring people in? How can we make people a part of this group and this family? And I know being in the community, um, what you guys are doing with, with the Dynamo, I know the challenges that have been there. Um, it's been really cool to see a lot of the progress you guys have made. And um, obviously between Diana and Jacob and both of you, you guys are in really good hands. So excited whenever this gets done to, to make it back out to uh, BBVA and, uh, and, and grab a beer in person uh, after, after one of the games. Absolutely. I'll meet you guys at Woodrow's after the game. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds good. Thank All you right. so much, Brett. Thanks. Appreciate it. Thank you.